I believe that now is the most exciting time in product development technology that we have ever seen. Not only are the changes big, but they're imminent. And so that's why I decided to call this talk why your product design practices won't survive in 2020 is because things that you're going to see at this conference are truly transformational. And there's a lot of them, six at least. And I think they're bigger than CAD. So for those of you who were around in the early 90s, I do these things called drafting boards. None of us can really remember them anymore, but there's pictures, and most they're in black and white. Um, but introducing powerful personal computing devices, and you may recall that they were like $25,000 each silicon graphics machines, I mean, they weren't PCs as we know them today. But introducing those things along with 3D solid modeling was transformational. It was a bigger than big deal. We wound up with more um, faster design cycles, better quality products, less expense. It was transformational. The trends we're going to talk about today are that big, especially collectively, I believe they're bigger. So let's start with the Internet of Things. Right? How many of you in the room currently have a pilot project going on or a product in the field that has IoT capability? Come on, anybody? Okay, so a few. I'll share some research with you about how common that is becoming. We've done quite a bit of research on that. How about generative design? I, mean, I don't know if you're all familiar with generative design. Uh, the notion that you can give an algorithm your design envelope, connection points, and <coughs> load requirements, and actually have it build the geometry for you. I mean, it seems kind of futuristic, um, to say the least. How many? How long? How far away is that? I mean, I'm giving away the title of my talk, right? It's not five years away. You already know that. But could it be two years away? I mean, I saw a beta example last year at SolidWorks World, and it promised that that beta will be commercially available this year. So this year. So these are the six trends we're going to talk about today. You can see them here on the word slide. We've got. Internet of Things, Digital Twin, uh, Ramesh Halberai, thankfully, is here from Deso Systems. He'll do a much more thorough job of explaining that than I would. Um, augmented and virtual reality, machine learning, generative design, and then the notion of products as a service, which can turn on its head the things that are most important to you in product development. So let's talk about the first one, IoT. Obviously, the biggest deal of IoT is the smallest deal, which is that the size of price of sensors has shrunk. This is an actual life-size image of an optical sensor, right? Optical sensors, fantastically useful if you want to check whether or not a package is on a conveyor line. And that's a great application for a big, expensive optical sensor. This optical sensor is tiny, and at volume, it's two bucks, two dollars, wow. This is a temperature sensor. It's only three millimeters square, but it's no ordinary thermometer. It's also a humidity sensor. It has single conditioning circuitry in it. It's three bucks at volume. At that price, you can instrument everything. And people are. Product development teams are instrumenting everything. Right? I put my phone away, but your phone has, well, at least mine has six sensors in it low-cost sensors, which can allow Apple to sell these things at a price that will grudgingly pay, and it can be wildly profitable. And that isn't just, that, that goes for all sensors. Yeah, LiDAR is still expensive, but you know, community sensors, vibration sensors, all of those things are tiny, and they're economic, and you can absolutely instrument your equipment, whatever device that you make and put it in the field, you absolutely can instrument it and start to gather data. That's an exciting possibility. This is a slide, one of the first slides of research that I'll show you uh, from a research study we did a few months ago. And what it does is we surveyed 241 product development professionals and we asked them about the state of Internet of Things development in their organizations. And we asked them on a sliding scale of not doing it, thinking about it, evaluating it, we've got a pilot, or we have 
a production, a product in the field, and this is what they told us. And it's by application. So for example, 62% of them told us that they wanted to, or they were evaluating at least, or had a pilot or a product, they were looking at automated device management. And the same percentage were looking at analytics of product components. Even the least popular application we asked about, which was control loop performance optimization, over half of the product development teams said that they were at least evaluating it. So, interesting. Your competitors are doing this, right? It's happening. And product development platforms are evolving that allow you to get to not have to participate in all the ugly, messy, heavy lifting that Internet of Things pioneers had to do, right? They had to like figure out all the communication protocols and all the different sensors and knit that together in some ugly way. These platforms manage all that for you. Not only do they manage the connections, but they give you some basic reporting, right? Some basic analysis, store the data in a meaningful way. So the other thing that, of course, is because it's Internet of Things, these are all offered as services on the cloud. And so if you want to try something, you can run it as a pilot in a small controlled scenario where you can prove value rather than having to go all in by big piece of enterprise software, set up your servers and go. So, what is stopping people, excuse me for a second. So what is stopping people, the number one response as to why we don't have a product in the field yet is that we don't have people who have the skills in our organization. And of course, when something is new and growing very, very quickly, that's bound to be a challenge. So how do you address that challenge? Do you go headhunting? I would suggest grow your own, right? Again, a great thing from a pilot project is that you get some skills in your organization and you learn some things because there just aren't enough skilled IoT product development engineers out there for you to hire. So that was topic number one. Topic number two, the digital twin, some people refer to it as a digital thread. How many people in the room have seen this movie? You don't have to put your hands up. I know the answer already. It's all of you, right? Everyone has seen Apollo 13. And I would bet that for more than half of you, it makes your top 10 list of favorite movies of all time, right? Because it's an engineering story where the engineers are the heroes, and it's fantastic. And so for those of you who haven't seen it or don't recall exactly what happened, an oxygen tank exploded on the way to the moon, and the team <laughs> had to move from the command module to the lunar module, or the other way around, I don't recall, and it was overloaded with people. The CO2 scrubbers weren't set up to handle that much, that many people in the one module. They were overloaded. The astronauts were going to suffocate and die. So, the ground crew have a set of things that are available to scavenge inside the lunar and command module. They need, the first answer is obviously, take the extra CO2 scrubbers from the lunar module, put them in the command model, all, module will all be well, but of course, classic scenario of square peg, round hole, they were built by different suppliers, right? The CO2 scrubbers were built by different suppliers, they didn't fit, one, some were, the ones in the command module were cubes and the other ones were cylinders. So, what happens, the heroes on the ground have a mechanical twin. They have a box of stuff that they can use, parts of spacesuits, tube socks, right? duct tape, and they knit this thing together to hear that the guy who looks like Tommy Lee Jones but isn't, uh, is holding, and they save the day, right? So that's an example of a, mechanic, a twin, the value of simulating something on the ground. Because they couldn't do it in space, they did it in space, they get it wrong once and they're dead. That didn't work. So the value of a digital twin is really quite obvious. It may not be as dramatic and life-threatening as this, but it really is a great opportunity for your business. So, because a digital twin allows you to simulate a real-world system, Gartner named it as one of their top 10 technology trends of 2017. That ability 
to identify and predict, not just describe, but predict whether something will work as you anticipate. And of course, if you close the loop with Internet of Things functionality on your products, you can actually determine whether or not your predictions have come true in the real world. It's an exciting development. Now, one of the things that really makes this possible at a grand scale is this notion of platformization. So this is just one vendor, and it happens to be Vesso, who has been <coughs> on a very aggressive acquisition spree over the last number of years to knit this whole thread together from requirements gathering and concepts right on through documentation, validation, verification, everything up and down the system to, be, to deployment, but beyond that, including production and including assets in the field and tracking and looping that all the way back around so that you have a common view of your products and their performance in the field and you can simulate them with a high degree of fidelity. And the thing that I find really interesting and I don't want to bore you with is I also think that platform architecture is exciting and I hope Ramesh will speak to that because this notion of what so many of us do today, which is passing files around and checking them in and out. If you have a platform, like the 3D Experience platform, the idea is that you're actually sharing a different view of common data rather than passing files around. And so the idea, I mean, I already know the answer to this because we've studied this many times. How much time do teams lose working on the wrong versions of documents? Right, tons, literally. You know, eight hours a week in some cases. It's a big deal. So the promise of a platform is really very exciting. So how do you get started? Well, you certainly don't start here, right? <laughs> you don't start with a virtual reality uh, simulation of an entire aircraft. If you think that that's where you've got to start, you'll never begin because it's too daunting. But you can start. You can start small. If you think about a subsystem that's manageable, Something, and, and then a business problem, some data that you might be able to get out of that, some prediction that would be useful. You might be able to get to an effective and valuable digital twin, at least of that. You know, if pick a time frame, something that's going to take weeks or months, not years to develop. That'll give you your proof of concept, your proof of value that you can then use to argue for more resources to build it out further. So next up, augmented and virtual reality. This is happening. So when I make my prediction, I don't think it's particularly bold, um, that I think virtually, I, I think all of you will have at least experienced it by 2020, and at least half of you will have this in your design processes somewhere. I mean, why? First off, the price of headsets is absolutely falling. You can get high fidelity headsets for less than $1,000. And at that price, I mean, if you recall, most of you don't, you're not old enough, but a seat of CAD in 1994, it's like $50,000, right? So breakthrough technology for less than a thousand bucks. Wow, right? And so when would you ever possibly use virtual reality? Well, in lots of places you use it. So imagine you make offshore, offshore oil rigs, right? You can't build a prototype, and you certainly can't experience what that thing's actually gonna be like through a screen, right? But can you explore it? virtual reality? Absolutely. What about products where you have a design team that's distributed and you want to share the prototype securely, you don't want to ship them around. This happens to be Steelcase, manufacturer of office furniture in Grand Rapids, Michigan, but they also have design teams in Asia. They have design teams in Europe. Their prototypes cost around $34,000 each for an office chair, and they're secret, and they're costly, and it takes too long. So if you can instead use virtual reality, now I'm not going to pretend you can sit in virtual reality, you can't, you can't get the full experience, but can you eliminate a couple of cycles? Absolutely. So they've had tremendous success with this. This example is not virtual reality, not the full immersion, this is augmented reality. What it is is a technician holding up an iPad and using the iPad camera to look at a caterpillar generator. And what they're doing with that caterpillar generator is they're looking at a maintenance repair operation. What they're using it for is to see step-by-step step how to replace a failed part on the generator. 
It's an absolutely transformational use of technology to assist in maintenance and repair. And finally, this just came out. This is an image of a SOLIDWORKS model being viewed through a Meta 2 headset. So look at how high fidelity it is. Uh, instead of using wands and things, I mean, I don't know how many of you have ever experienced a virtual reality cave where you put on the goggles and you wave the, you, know, you wave the big wands around and stuff, and then you go up and you try to like move parts and it doesn't really work. This is available now. It was released about, I think, just at the end of May. And um, you save a lot of the clunky bits of VR, right? You can actually just, you can just save your model as a VR type model, you know, something you can do in VR, like snap or I just, and away you go. So very cool for a lot of purposes. Uh, my next example is machine learning. Um, machine learning has come from beta to reality remarkably fast. So fast that I'm guessing that some of you in the room may not have quite seen it. But you can buy, as a service, natural language processing, image recognition, text-to-speech, speech-to-text, from these providers, Amazon, Microsoft, Google. Think about how the interface is with your products today. And could those be better using speech? Probably, in many cases, I suspect the answer is yes. So we're going to see a wave of natural language processing and these sorts of machine learning applications across all sorts of industrial products. Uh, maybe a simple answer here, Engineering.com is an example I'm very familiar with, as you can imagine. Uh, so Amazon released their Amazon Web Services machine learning platform in beta about 16 months ago. And it was something that we've been waiting for for a long time. So we jumped on the beta because what we wanted to do was to be able to recommend better stories to our readers. So if someone comes in anonymously and they read a story, and they read all the way to the bottom, we've got all this data about them. We know what their browser was, where, where they're from, we know how long they were on the page, whether they've shared it with friends, whether they read to the bottom, whether they clicked any ads, and we've got about 70 pieces of data from every single browser session that we keep track of. So you have all this data, and of course, Google long ago taught us that we could then recommend the next story based on the content of the story you just read. So if you just read a story about VR, you know, uh, for office furniture, we could show you another story, but we might not be that good about whether we chose to show you another VR story or another office furniture story. So what we wanted to do was get smarter about who the people were and start to be able to predict whether the people who were reading that story <coughs> were aerospace engineers or whether they were office furniture designers or who they were. And so we started to build patterns of browsing all anonymously and comparing that with people who were registered members. So we could tell more accurately what story would be most interesting for someone to read next. And so it's not perfect, but it's sure a lot better than you could do with just simple algorithms that we had before. And the thing that's just eye-watering about this is the price. It costs virtually nothing. Right? We get it in the low five figures, we got this done, and now we pay less than a thousand dollars a month to Amazon to run this machine learning engine. So at those prices, you can absolutely do all kinds of things with your um, product designs that you couldn't have done, well, I know for a fact, 18 months ago, right? It just wasn't available. Um, this company, Kona Cranes, was a real pioneer. I spoke with Yua Pankakoski, who is their chief technology officer, and it was about five years ago that they started instrumenting their cranes. So the kind of cranes I'm talking about are the big ones, uh, shipyards, uh, overhead in factories and warehouses. Uh, they have 500,000 of these in the field, and they started instrumenting them in every way that they could think of and gathering the data, even though they didn't really know exactly what they were going to do with the data. They just knew that it would be valuable. And they had this kind of inkling that maybe they could sell some sort of extra services around that, but they didn't know exactly what. So this is a profound example of an insight that they were able to gather by having this data and analyzing it through a machine learning engine. They, by training the operators on your second shift not to use the emergency brake for operations, you can increase your crane life by 30%. Now, that's the kind of insight. It's just not possible for humans to sift through all of this. Right? 
but machines can identify opportunities like this and surface these insects. It's very exciting. So, yeah, could this be something that you pilot? I would say absolutely. Now, generative design. I mentioned it earlier at the opening, and I'm very excited about this because we've seen how hard it is to design parts, and the notion that the person who's designing the part has to have all the knowledge of how that part should be designed, what the geometry, geometry should look like. And instead, possibly, parts should look like this, but this is not a design that any human would come up with. It just, it just isn't. It's a result of countless iterations to get there. So one of my colleagues, Michael Alba, has just interviewed 12 different technology vendors about generative design. And he's about to publish a report, I think this month. Uh, we're just putting the cover page on it now. And let's just hear what Michael has to say. What is generative design? Ask a handful of engineers, you'll get a handful of responses. But one of the most common answers is this. Generative design is the use of computational algorithms to not just verify a design, but to actively create it. In this way, it's a true design collaboration between engineer and computer. And it's just getting started. Consider the most common type of generative design today, topology optimization. In TopOp, you tell the computer what it has to work with, your so-called design space, and what it has to work around, your low cases like forces and boundary conditions. The computer will chisel away everything you don't need, leaving you with a design that not only handles the requisite loads, but does so in the most efficient way possible. Another type of generative design is lattice generation. Instead of optimizing the topology directly, lattice generation replaces parts of the design space with structurally equivalent lattices, significantly reducing the weight of the part. This technology is already being applied in industries like aerospace and automotive to lightweight designs. For example, the ESA's Sentinel 1C and 1D Earth observation satellites will be launched with an optimized antenna bracket that's 40% lighter than the original design. And that's just a one antenna bracket. Imagine the greater potential in material, manufacture, and fuel savings to be had. In the words of one engineer we spoke with, generative design is the next generation of CAD. I don't know about you, but I'm excited to see how far we go. Okay, thanks Michael. He shot that for me last week, so we have it here. Uh, he just wrapped up his report, and um, I do hope you'll take a look at it when it's available. Now, one of the things that may have been rather obvious to you as you look at all of these different generatively designed or topology optimized parts is that they don't look like you can build them, right? They look like you really can't make them at any kind of scale. Now, Mark Forge um, has developed some wonderful technology to be able to create usable real world parts, but still, at scale, how are you going to deal with this, right? You can't make 10,000 economically. Um, you can use it, at least for inspiration, for what your machine and component could be. Uh, or your, whether it's injection molded or whatever your process is, you could take that design that was generatively pr provided for you, and you can use the intelligence in that design to create something of your own. But some technology vendors are actually putting those um, constraints within their software already. So you can say, oh, well not only do I want this generatively designed, but I would, well, here's the process that I'm going to use to make this. And so now you can constrain it. And you can have something that you can make at scale. So really fascinating, very, I mean, very, very um, quick to arrive on the market. I mean, two years ago we were talking about this and it was nobody had a commercial product. But now as I said, SolidWorks is committed to having a commercial product on the market by the end of the year. But Michael also, as I said, spoke with 12 different vendors of products of companies who have functionality like this. And it's the combination of the advances in software and the advances in computing capability that have allowed this to become real. So, very exciting. And I can't imagine there's anybody in the room who doesn't make any kind of parts that could possibly be generatively designed. I mean, you probably do. And at the price point of this software and the general availability of this software, I've got to believe that within two years or sooner, you will have tried it and experience the results for yourself. 
So I say that there's six things that are going to be in your product development pro processes by 2020. Almost for sure, someone in your organization will be experimenting with this. It's low cost. And I mean, Michael, our journalist and engineer, I mean, he downloaded this and actually built some models himself. It's not that hard. It's really quite remarkable. Not that I'm throwing my clock in the box, you understand that, right? I'm just <laughs> saying it was uh, absolutely achievable. So the final trend I'd like to talk to you about is product as a service. This is a picture of the Dubai Electric and Water Authority. Their large facility in Dubai, and you can see it's all lit up at night. Now you've all heard of Rolls-Royce selling power by the hour, and you're getting tired of listening to people telling you you should Uberize your company or turn it into Lyft or what have you, right? I mean, that doesn't always apply, but I thought this example was interesting because it's an industrial company who made this different, made this change. It's Philips, Philips Lighting. So their industry is being disrupted by LED, right? Because you can't sell as many LEDs as you can sell incandescents because LEDs last a really, really long time. You need a new income stream. How do you get that? So maybe we could do some sort of managed service. Well, who needs someone to manage their lighting? Well, Dubai Electric and Water Authority was a very good match for this requirement. And so Philips made them a, an offer. They said, we'll cut your energy consumption from lighting by 68% if you let us manage this project. And so it happened. And so Philips, instead of selling light bulbs and fixtures, is selling a managed service of lighting. I mean, how mundane is that, right? So they could do it. Just to have a guessing everyone else in the room here can do that. Uh, and they were successful in this particular instance. This is a slide from the consultancy Accenture. Accenture makes the point that all natural resource-based businesses are going to be squeezed due to ever-increasing costs because there are only so many natural resources in the world. That sounds fundamentally, you know, you take a long enough view, that sounds like it must be true. Um, but as consumers and businesses move towards more sustainable products, it changes how product development people think about their products. And if you start to think about your product as a service, you're gonna change some of the things about how you design those products. So instead of having the maximum number of products going through your factory at a fixed gross margin, you're instead going to start to think about how can you extract the most value from that product over a longer term of service. And if, you are the one, your company, is responsible for the function of that product in the field, then you're going to design some things a little bit differently. Right? Certain parts might be more robust. And if you instrument those things, right, then you will be able to develop some forms of predictive maintenance and be able to send technicians at the right time and intervene with any other maintenance or repair operation. So it's exciting, but it really requires a different way of thinking. If you get to that thinking, let me give you just two examples. So, good example, bad example. Bad example first. This, uh, on the left, is a hand washing station. You see it in the production facilities all over the place. Um, this company who makes this hand washing station, who shall remain nameless, explored the idea of product as a service, which is not a bad thing to do. They thought, well, let's go ahead and instrument these hand washing stations. We'll know when they run out of soap, and we'll send a technician to refill them. Um, now, the costs to instrument, the cost to manage that network, gather the data, but the real killer is the cost to send technicians, right? The cost to send a technician to go for refill soap and so on just frankly isn't worth it. When the custodial staff on site can just look and see if the soap is empty and they can refill this dispenser. So an interesting idea, but economically not there. The example on the right is a company called Rital. I spoke with them. They make air conditioners for electrical enclosures for production environments. Sounds very, very niche, but uh, they make an awful lot of these things because any given production environment could have, a, well, they, their customers have anywhere from three to 300 of these things in a single facility. So what they are, they're, so you imagine all the electrical enclosures in a production environment. All of those have to be air conditioned, protected, and they have to be uh, willing to, they, they have to be able to withstand a harsh environment of dust, you know, vibration, no 
noise, humidity, heat, all kinds of things. So their new Blue E Plus air conditioner, which they just brought to market last year, they instrumented it like crazy. They put in <clears throat> 10 different sensors, you know, fan speed, humidity, inside, outside, ambient temperatures, vibration, and all kinds of stuff. And they deployed these into some of their close customer factories. And they built an application on one of the development platforms <coughs> to gather the data from these Blue E Plus air conditioners. And sure enough, they started to be able to detect before a fan failed, for example, you know, that there was some extra vibration in that fan, or that the airflow had slowed down, or various indicators that started to give them insights. So they're <coughs> thinking now that they can sell predictive maintenance as a service. Now, why would this work as compared to the hand washing station? Well, it's a lot more critical if one of these fails in the field then a production facility could lose some equipment for some period of time. That's a bad thing. So the, the value of it is high. The technical requirement to fix it, they do actually have to send a technician. But when they go to that facility now, they can look at all of the Louis Plus air conditioners on the, on the floor. Say there's 300, but they don't have to physically look at them. They can get a little health from their application that just tells them whether or not everything's fine and only deal with the ones who are starting to move a little bit out of spec. So exciting. If you think about the things that you're building and that you're making, is there any possibility that you're dealing with air conditioners rather than hand washing station? It's worth thinking about. So again, when we surveyed product design teams, product development teams about whether or not they were considering you offering any of their products as a service, 63% said that they were evaluating it, and fully 33% said they were either piloting it or deploying, deploying it. Now that doesn't mean all of their products, right? There's a whole bunch of ways you can go about this. You can start, the first thing you have to do is start gathering the data, for sure. So, you know, that was one of the things that was great about our machine learning and engineering.com is we already had tons of data. We have two and a half million visitors a month. That's a lot. That gives you a lot of data pretty fast. So that's great. You might not be in the same scenario, um, but if you start to collect the data, you can start to see where there are opportunities to potentially offer some of that data as a service. Or maybe you've got a new product that's coming out, or you think you've got a really, really friendly customer in a single installation, and you might like to use that. And think about how you could possibly offer that as a service. I remember when we started offering some of our products as a service, it was a little frightening, frankly. But you eventually get to learning what's on the other side of the fence, what the customer is dealing with, and then you can be successful and move forward. The first one is tough, though. So, my message to you is that you can pilot these things at relatively low cost, relatively low risk. You already have the resources you need on your teams to do most of these things. Right? You don't need to go outside. You probably don't really even need to tell anyone. Right? You can expect a sort of VR glasses, right? Or a couple of licenses on an IoT platform and a, you know, an Arduino kit and some sensors. I mean, these are very, very economic if you have an experimental mindset. That's really what's required more than anything is just be willing to experiment, prove value on a small scale, and once you've proven that value, you can scale it up. But these six things are, they're big. They're bigger than CAD. You may recall, <laughs> At the opening, we talked about CAD and throwing away the drafting boards. These trends are not big. These trends are bigger. And it's exciting and it's happening now. I mean, I really encourage you to take those pilots, make your own design revolution, and we are going to do the best we can to be there for you to provide research and insights on these technology trends. I hope you'll take a look at engineering.com, possibly download some resources. Not all of these reports are available yet. Some of them are just coming out. But if you do register for any of the ones that are published, we will absolutely send you invitations to download the rest. Thanks very much.